When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your children shall prophesy and your young shall see visions, and your elders shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves of all genders, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stand Oh, but when I look around And I see what's being done to my kind Every day I'm being hard to this prey My people don't want no trouble We've had enough strong goals I just want to live, God protect me, I just want to live, I just want to live. Hello again, beloved. Will you pray with me and prepare your hearts for a word? Holy One, let your spirit fall afresh on my mouth, my preaching, our hearing. May each of us hear the word we most need in our time of need. Speak directly to our hearts. Amen. The story of Pentecost is, above all, a story about people coming together, despite their differences, to become one, 
a people who dream and create something the world has never seen before. Is it a history lesson or a fairy tale? It's fair to ask that this week. Because the story is also about people who speak really different languages and now can suddenly understand each other, I initially thought I would use it to preach about how to negotiate boundaries as we begin to unshelter from the pandemic. Reentry is going to take mature communication skills as we attempt to ask each other for what we need to be safe. Correcting mask wearing etiquette in the grocery store, setting boundaries on bathroom use when our friend comes over to sit on the porch, dodging the elderly parent who forgets about the virus for a second and goes in for a hug during a socially distanced visit. It's a dance between self-preservation and respect for others. Our goals are freedom and safety and life abundant, not just for ourselves, but for all people. Everything we do and say has invisible consequences, sometimes fatal. So we have to learn how to communicate really, really well. We have to be able to speak each other's languages. This was going to be my sermon. Then two things happened on Monday, a thousand miles apart, that demanded our attention as people of faith. In their way, these stories are also about freedom and safety and life abundant for all people. Amen. And how we communicate in ways that deeply respect the other or fail to with fatal consequences. I know you know the stories, but they bear repeating. We need to feel the power of them in our bodies. And we need to say the names of the people they are about. On Monday in New York City, Amy Cooper, a white investment banker, had her dog bounding off leash in an area of Central Park reserved for birding and other quiet enjoyment. She was breaking the rules. When Christian Cooper, a black man, no relation, asked her to leash her dog, she took offense and escalated their disagreement. She was unhappy being told what to do by a black man. So he began filming, which aggravated her, and she threatened to call the cops on him. She taunts in the video, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. And then she follows through on her threat. Her anger transformed suddenly to crocodile tears when her 911 call is answered. The call was nothing short of weaponized whiteness. She knew such a call could get Christian hurt or even killed. Twelve hours later in Minneapolis, George Floyd, a black man, bought some cigarettes at a corner store. The clerk suspected him of having passed a counterfeit $20 bill and called the cops on him. When four cops arrived, they handcuffed him. Then one of the four pushed him face down on the ground and put a knee on his neck. And he kept it there for seven minutes as George cried out repeatedly, in an echo of Eric Garner, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. As he wept and he begged for his life, which was pouring out of him. He called for his mother, who had died two years earlier. Mama, Mama, I'm through. It was an echo of Christ from the cross, calling out to his heavenly parent in an invocation and saying, finally, in defeat or simple acknowledgement, it is finished. Two days later, two days later, the four policemen responsible for George's murder were still walking around free and Minneapolis began to burn. 
It has not stopped. This is not the Pentecost we expected. This is not Phil Porter's prodigal red balloon installation, red church lady hats, strawberries at coffee hour. These are not the flames we hoped to fan. This is the blood and fire and smoky mist Peter preached about in the temple that day. For a long time, beloved, we celebrated a domesticated Pentecost. We lived, or some of us thought we lived, in a world safe enough that the fire could become symbolic. We were wrong. We know that now. I submit as an additional sacred text today these words from the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown, Senior Minister of Plymouth UCC in Seattle, which she wrote on her own Facebook page when a white man she didn't know suggested there that the initial protests and riots on the streets of Minneapolis were inappropriate. Kelly wrote back to him, the rioting in Minneapolis is absolutely the result of oppression, and I take offense to quotation marks you used. This country has given black folks no way to thrive, no way to process, no way to grieve, no way to stay safe, no legal recourse, but our grief must be neat. Please show me how you protested when white folks tear things up after a championship. Their celebrations look like our protest, and there is never the pushback or shaming. This country will monetize and prop everything on capitalism. Our health care, our ability to be housed, our ability to eat and what we eat, but the biggest sin is the destruction of property. We have to break open the respectability politics pervasive in the conversation about what's happening as a result to bold-face racism and an economy that thrives on black death. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown. James Baldwin took the name of one of his books on racism in America, The Fire Next Time, from the spiritual, Oh Mary, Don't You Weep. It sings, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water but the fire next time. 60 years ago, as the last great civil, civil rights movement was just gaining steam, Baldwin predicted that if we did not finally address the white supremacy at the heart of America, it would end in fire. He probably didn't imagine it would simmer for 60 more years till the moment when we elected a racist president who over the course of his tenure has with his idiot savant ways, stoked the fires of white supremacy and emboldened people whose worst impulses might have been previously checked by civil society to outrageous acts of violence against people of color. Even worse, white supremacy is finding ever new and more insidious forms of taking black lives, brown lives, under his jurisdiction. It has even taken over the protests for justice for George Floyd. The word from Minneapolis, from Atlanta, from Oakland, I watched the videos myself, is that there are white agent provocateurs infiltrating the crowds of protesters and breaking windows, burning buildings, and looting. In some cases, they may be misguided, would-be white allies, but certainly in others, they are organized white militants fomenting a race war that will be blamed on Black people. In all cases, they are further endangering the lives of Black and Brown people. This is not the Pentecost we came for. The first line of the Pentecost story says, and they were all together in one place. Well, we are not all together in one place, not physically, not even metaphorically. We started this sheltering season with the mantra, for the first time in history, everyone in the world is going through the exact same thing together. Coronavirus has brought us all 
together. Then we amended that to, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. But now as COVID rates spike highest amongst black people in Oakland, and Latinx people in the mission, it's become clear that we are not even in the same storm. We are 11 weeks into the quarantine and many of us are surprised to find ourselves mostly okay. This in itself is unsettling. I wanna suggest that some of us are experiencing a kind of survivor guilt, bystanders to the worst of the crisis, which has in fact brought some of us blessings in the form of a slower, sweeter life. COVID made most of us scared to go outside for a season, but racism is a pandemic that makes a whole swath of our human family scared to go outside ever. I've been texting with my 20 year old Haitian foster son in Boston this week. His whole life should be opening up before him right now. But instead, he's staying inside all the time because if he even goes to the peaceful protest to speak up for his right to live, he could be beaten, deported, or killed. White folks, I know you feel like I do, disgusted, horrified, and heartbroken. Can we sustain that feeling? Is what is happening this week enough fuel that our fire won't go out this time? Here's a hard thing for white people to hear. Marvin K. Marvin K. White, our Marvin, not ours, our friend Marvin K. White wrote this on his Facebook page this week. He calls it invocation number four. Anti-semanticism. He was not killed because he was black. He was killed because you are white. Hashtag George Floyd. White folks, we are not directly responsible for the death of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery, but we live here and we benefit from the system that built itself on the backs of black folks and still oppresses black, Latinx and indigenous folks in ways that are increasingly obvious, even to clueless us. And just as people of color and Jews carry generational trauma in their bodies, so do white Protestants and white Catholics with both slave owning and abolitionist genes carry this very conflict in our bodies. One of the side effects of COVID is that it's, it, is it, it has isolated us into our homes and neighborhoods, which even in sunny multiracial California are still pretty segregated. We know that when we are different and diverse and together in the same room, it is electrifying the way it was on the first Pentecost. It's why some of us have sought out this church because while we are still majority white and still for sure, sure have a lot to work on, we are blessed that we are increasingly multiracial and not monochromatic. I wanna say right now to all the black, and Latinx and Asian and biracial and multiracial folks who claim your place in First Church's sanctuary and sacred space and leadership, how much you bless the rest of us by being here. Thank you for sticking with this community when the white folks here, myself included, mess up, say ignorant or hurtful things, or when our courage fails us. Thank you because I truly believe that God's kingdom will only come when we are all together in one place like those early disciples, because the Holy Spirit shows up, that fire shows up, not in spite of, but because of our diversity. We are not all the way there yet. A giant conflagration of a congregation on fire with Pentecostal fuel. But we are a pilot light Perhaps, can we burn like that, steady, and not go out? 
Can we be the spark that sets a hundred refining fires? We forget sometimes that at Pentecost, the people did not suddenly start speaking the same language. This is not a story of assimilation. Every unique ethnicity is named as being presente. Their distinctions are not collapsed. Their distinctions are important. And because of their distinctiveness, they gain power. This is not the Tower of Babel, the people thrown into chaos and fighting because they couldn't understand each other, unable to accomplish a great task together. This is the undoing of Babel. This is not chaos, but unifying power. I am coming to understand that racism in America will not end until white people are so heartbroken and disgusted by the racism in our air, water, soil, and in ourselves that we find a way to end it forever. We won't legislate it away. Some of you here tried that 60 years ago and it helped, but a lot of it just found new and covert ways of thriving. Beloved, Will we keep our Pentecostal pilot light alive because the world needs our hot-headedness? White folks in particular, the world needs our fierceness and clarity. Our brothers and sisters and siblings of color need us to talk to other white people who don't see it yet. It needs us to step into witness and de-escalate when cops or anyone are harassing people of color. This has to be our fight too. Because you know what? It is our fight. These are our people whose lives are on the line. These are Naima and Dorothy and Terry and Jackie and Dr. Pam and John and Brittany and Hannah and Kai and Constance and Angela and Sean and Elena and Diane and Jeffrey and Nathan and Sharla, Malia and Noel and Jonah and Latanya. Chalazier and Chima and Anya Lee, Alex and Christine and Evan and Marvin and Ernest and Shoyinka. And please forgive me if I've left anyone out. You are not left out just because my brain is not all working today. You are in, baby. We are not all together in one place, but we can be all together in one purpose. Right now we are voting on an initiative that has the potential to bring us together as one to rebuild after a fire. There is so much we can build together if we work as people of different languages, but one understanding, one love, one purpose at a time. Amen.